What's up guys? So, a while back, I posted a survey on YouTube asking you guys what your thoughts and opinions were on Skyrim and how you thought the game could be adapted into a live-action cinematic format. My favorite comment came from a subscriber who goes by the username The Dark Lord. His ideas inspired me to collaborate with him in creating this video, where we're going to pitch to you guys how we would adapt Bethesda's world-renowned 2011 fantasy RPG Skyrim. I also want to take this time to make a quick announcement. I've had this channel for about three years now, and I've always been a one-man show. But recently, I decided to bring the Dark Lord on board the channel. He was one of my very first followers, and he's now become an official co-writer for Phoenix Studios. And he's going to be helping me out from time to time with some of my videos. So welcome to the channel, the Dark Lord. Now on with the show. Thanks to Netflix's adaptation of Castlevania, as well as a few other sources of inspiration like The Mandalorian and his Dark Materials, we believe that adaptations usually work best as TV shows due to long-form storytelling, enabling showrunners enough time to do the characters and the story justice without fear of restricted screen time. Skyrim is no different, and we are confident that a television series set with three seasons would be the best way to adapt Skyrim into a cinematic medium while also remaining loyal to the source material and simultaneously satisfying fans. Season 1 would adapt the vanilla game's main campaign with the Dragonborn facing off against Alduin, while Season 2 will be dedicated to adapting the Dragonborn DLC, and Season 3 will wrap up the entire Skyrim show as a climactic finale while also incorporating some elements from the Dawnguard DLC. We also want to take a moment to acknowledge that our ideas for this video were inspired by the Skyrim Extended Cut modding team and their concepts that they shared with the Skyrim community on their Discord page. Because of how epic and ambitious this vision is, the Dark Lord and I chose to approach this adaptation in an animated format because of how crazily expensive and difficult a live action production would be. Plus, in animation, your imagination and your set pieces are not as limited by the budget as live action usually is. Ideally, we would like to think that Netflix or a similar studio would fund a risky and ambitious production such as this. And if that's the case, then the studio would probably push for the art direction to be a realistic anime style such as the one used in Castlevania, or at least be anime inspired as seen in Dragon's Dogma and The Dragon Prince, or hopefully a style that's completely new and different like Netflix's Arcane. Our main protagonist, the Dragonborn, will be ignored to help maintain the iconic imagery that came as a result of the game's promotional material. We imagined our Dragonborn to be the strong and silent type of character, a lone wolf, and a man of few words. Similar to Din Djarin and the man with no name, he would be someone who possesses the big and burly berserker side of Conan the Barbarian, the honorable and quiet nature of Samurai Jack, and the down-to-earth but also uneducated qualities of Rocky Balboa, a man with street smarts but no book smarts, as he comes from a humble and simple background as an illiterate farmer. This would give our Dragonborn some weaknesses as he would have to rely on other characters to read or write for him. His gear that he starts off with can be an indication as to how our version of the Dragonborn is a bit of a scavenger and an improviser, using whatever he can find to help him get by. Some of his equipment is well made, but most of it is mismatched and secondhand. But like the Mandalorian, we want the Dragonborn to improve his gear and upgrade throughout the series in a very video game fashion. Despite his grim warrior code of honor, the Dragonborn would be someone who loves to party, and he would be a fun and boisterous drinker, lover, and merrymaker just like the Vikings of old. We'd also want to make our Dragonborn comedically impolite in social and political situations like Drax the Destroyer, since our Dragonborn is such a blunt and brutally honest person. Like Din Djarin, our Dragonborn will have a real name, like Haran, Alaric, Torbald, or something like that. But he'll almost always be referred to by his nickname, Dragonborn, like how Din Djarin is always called Mando. Naturally, we would want the Dragonborn to be the main protagonist for all three seasons of this series, and give him a character arc for each season. For season one, the Dragonborn's character arc will revolve around the people of Skyrim thrusting the Chosen One archetype upon him, even though he never asked for that kind of pressure or responsibility, nor did he ever want it. His arc will reflect the season's theme, 
only a few people can do something great for the world, but everyone can do something great for the people around them. With the Dragonborn not only rising up to be a hero for Skyrim, but inspiring others around him to also rise up and become their own heroes. For Season 1, we separated Skyrim's main quest into 22 episodes that are each 20 to 30 minutes long, and we're going to briefly go over each episode to help give you a general outline for the direction we would take this show. Now, two disclaimers before we move forward. 1. We removed any and all quest lines that didn't help elevate or streamline the story, so that means several of the game's factions, such as the Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhood, the Nightingales, the Bard's College, and the College of Winterhold, won't appear in this season because they're not relevant to the main conflict of Alduin's return. But, that doesn't necessarily mean they can't be recycled for future seasons in the show. 2. For the sake of time, we left out a lot of details in the summaries of our episodes because this video is meant to just be a brief pitch and not an entire novel. We try to keep this as short as possible while also properly communicating our revision. So, there may be quite a few detailed questions you might have about our episodes that probably would have been answered if we included all of the minor information in our pitch, but alas, we just don't have the time for that. That being said, let's move on. Episode 1, Birth of a Dovakin. The episode starts with our Nord Dragonborn, outfitted in his iconic leather armor, horned helmet, and only armed with a simple steel sword and knife, an iron shield, and a bow, working as a sellsword and completing one of the game's side quests as a job for the locals. It doesn't really matter which side quest it is, what matters is that the side quest offers us an exciting and entertaining action sequence, while also providing a strong establishing character moment for the introduction of our main protagonist. The Dragonborn will complete the job and get paid, earning compliments on his proficiency as a mercenary thanks to his naturally straightforward and brutish personality. This type of work is his comfort zone. This is where he flourishes. Afterwards, the Dragonborn spends his earnings drinking, wrestling, and partying at a local tavern that he is staying at. While there, the Dragonborn overhears talk of the Stormcloak Rebellion against the Empire. The next morning, he travels back to his home village of Falkreath, where he visits his widowed mother at his childhood farmhouse. He also takes a moment to pay his respects to his deceased father, a retired sellsword who is buried alongside many other Nords at the massive Falkreath graveyard. While home, the Dragonborn receives an offer for another job, and he accepts. But while completing the mission, the Dragonborn finds himself caught in the crossfire of a Stormcloak ambush on an Imperial caravan. While trying to escape, the Dragonborn is captured by Imperial reinforcements and taken to Helgen, leading to the cart ride scene from the opening of the original game. The episode ends with the Dragonborn laying his head down on the Executioner's block. A dragon appears. Not Alduin, but Murmelnir, the first dragon that the PC kills in the original game. Episode 2, Saved by Dragonfire. Murmelnir incinerates Helgen, and the Dragonborn escapes with the help of Rayloth the Stormcloak and Hadvar the Imperial Officer. We see the animosity between the Stormcloaks and the Imperials through Rayloth and Hadvar's constant bickering even though they're in mortal danger. The Dragonborn manages to get the two bitter rivals to cooperate and come to an honorable compromise for the sake of their mutual survival, foreshadowing the temporary truce between the Stormcloaks and the Empire in the future. At some point, I want the Dragonborn to show how attached he is to his helmet by risking his life to stubbornly go back and retrieve the damaged and battle-worn helmet in the middle of a blazing firestorm, even though he was willing to leave behind the rest of his gear. The tension eases as the survivors travel through the caves beneath Helgen, and we get to learn about the civil war through the different perspectives of all three characters. The Dragonborn can later reveal to his companions that his helmet belonged to his father, and between father and son, that helmet has seen enough action for two lifetimes, hence the significant damage and broken horn on the helm. The episode ends with all three of them escaping to Riverwood, and we see a group of dragon cultists investigate the burning remains of Helgen. Episode 3, Riverwood. The Dragonborn, Rayloth, and Hadvar arrive at Riverwood to warn the village about the dragon attack. Thanks to the Dragonborn's influence, Rayloth and Hadvar agree not to take any hostile action towards each other at their mutual hometown of Riverwood, since it's neutral ground. The two soldiers thank the Dragonborn for his assistance and offer their homes to him as they each depart to return to their individual leaders, 
lest they become deserters. The Dragonborn decides to lay low and recover, finding a friend in his new elvish neighbor, Fengdal. The Dragonborn's peace is disrupted by the arrival of bandits seeking to terrorize the village, and, to make matters more personal, the bandit's chief is the Dragonborn's childhood bully. When the bandits start harassing Alvor the blacksmith, the Dragonborn steps in and fights back against the injustice, inspiring Fangdal to jump in and fight alongside him, insinuating a Seven Samurai type of episode. After being hailed a hero by the villagers, the Dragonborn is summoned to Whiterun to meet Jarl Balgruf concerning the attack on Helgen. The episode ends with the Dragon Cultists reporting their findings to their master. He is covered in shadow, but his voice sounds like a rotting corpse implying that he is a dragon priest. Episode 4, Whiterun. With Fangdal at his side, the Dragonborn rides to Whiterun. On the road, they witness Ayla the Huntress and her companions slaying a giant, and they become quick friends of the Dragonborn due to their similar lifestyles and philosophies. These mercenaries are the Dragonborn's favorite kind of people. Once they arrive in Whiterun, the newcomers will have their first encounter with Lydia and meet with Jarl Balgruf and the rest of his court confirming the reports that the Dragonborn is indeed a survivor of Helgen. With the return of the dragons confirmed, Jarl Balgruf hires the companions to find the Dragonstone in Bleak Falls Barrow. The companions will encourage the Dragonborn to join them on their quest, since they're all Nord mercenaries and they should stick together. The Dragonborn is reluctant to continue involving himself in this dragon business, which seems way out of his league, but he relents when the companions appeal to his inner warrior and spirit of adventure. Not to mention, they offer to split their reward with him. Ayla, in particular, seems attracted to the strong and silent Dragonborn, flirting with him despite the disapproval of Skjör. After an evening of feasting and bonding at Jorvisker, the Dragonborn and Fangdal will ride out with the companions to Bleak Falls Barrow. Episode 5, The Dead Speak. The party arrives at Bleak Falls Barrow, and they effortlessly plow their way through the horde of bandits raiding the barrow. At this rate, the party assumes that retrieving the Dragonstone will be an easy assignment. They are in for a horrible surprise when they encounter the Draugr for the first time. Some of the companions are killed, while the Dragonborn is separated from the rest of the party. He finds the Dragonstone and the Ward Wall, but is left all alone to fight the Draugr Guardian that bursts from the coffin. The Dragonborn is about to lose the fight until Feindal drops in and snipes the Draugr with an arrow while Ayla and the others finish it off. Bloodied and battered, the survivors of the party escape with their dead. Episode 6 The Dragon The party returns to Whiterun with the Dragonstone. Alvor barges in, reporting that both Riverwood and Falkreath have been destroyed by the dragon, and that Whiterun is next. The Dragonborn is horrified to learn of his home's destruction, and he prepares to rush back to see if his mother is still alive. But Irolith and Fangdal convince him to stay and fight because he can do more good here than anywhere else. The Dragonborn, Fangdal, Irolith, the surviving companions, and the White Run Guards take the battle to Mermenir at the Western Watchtower. Most of the hunting party is killed or injured. Meanwhile, the dragon is practically unharmed. With this elven accuracy, Fangdal makes a miraculous shot at the dragon's eye, but at the cost of his own life. Unleashing his Nordic fury, the Dragonborn leaps off the top of the tower down on top of the blind dragon below. As Mermelnir attempts to recover, the Dragonborn climbs onto the back of his head and thrusts his sword into his skull. Despite his victory, the Dragonborn remains unsatisfied due to the loss of his friend Fangdal. The surviving White Run guards question why the Dragonborn isn't celebrating his glorious triumph like a true Nord. Mermelnir's skin starts to evaporate, and his soul is absorbed into the Dragonborn as he instinctively shouts, Foos! at the insolent warrior. The guard is hurled backwards and knocked out, terrifying the others and astonishing the dragonborn. The tension builds until Irolith intervenes. She comforts the dragonborn and escorts him back to Whiterun, but not before he claims one of Mermelnir's horns as a personal trophy. For the final shot, we see the two surviving guards complaining about having to go back and load all of the dragon bones onto a cart because the Jarl wants to assemble the dragon skeleton into a giant statue for his hall. As they grumble about this assignment, the guards are murdered from behind by dragon cultists. Episode 7, Thane of Whiterun. The dragonborn returns to the Jarl, victorious but broken and depressed. The dragonborn goes to the local chantry, where the priestesses heal him, but 
Rumors of the event spread, including accounts of him being a dragonborn. Refugees from Riverwood and Falkreath confirmed that the dragonborn's mother was one of the casualties of Mirmolnir's attack, and the dragonborn takes some time off to mourn for his mother. Jarl Balgruff promises to help the dragonborn recover both physically and mentally, rewarding him with Bree's home and assigning Lydia as his personal house Carl. I am sworn to carry your burdens. We see that the dragonborn is being attended to by fans when they leave gifts for him at his front door, and the dragonborn starts to realize that he is growing a large following. Even Irilith comments on how impressed she is with the dragonborn's prowess. This lifts the dragonborn's spirits a little, but it still can't replace the hole in his heart for those close to him that he lost. In a public ceremony reminiscent of Star Wars A New Hope, Yal Balgruff announces the Dragonborn as a Thane of Whiterun, and generously gifts him with the Axe of Eastmarch. His Dragonborn status is revealed to the people of Whiterun, but when some skeptics amongst the audience call out the Dragonborn as a fake, he responds by shouting, Foos! The audience roars in excitement to hear the thoom and to see a living legend with their own eyes. The episode ends with the Dragonborn awaking in the middle of the night when he hears a deep voice call out, Episode 8, Journey of a Thousand Steps The Jarl informs Dragonborn that he has been summoned by the Greybeards and that he must go to High Hrothgar and make the journey of a thousand steps. The Dragonborn prepares for the journey and requests for the dragon horn he claimed from Mermelnir's skull to be used in replacing the broken horn on his helm. After looking at the poor condition of the Dragonborn's weapons and armor, Balgriff responds that he can do even better than that. He takes the Dragonborn to the Skyforge and not only repairs the helmet, but upgrades it with steel. And the Dragonborn transitions from leather armor to either ancient Nord armor or heavy steel armor. He also replaces the Dragonborn's damaged iron shield with a heavy Nordic shield. With Lydia at his side, the Dragonborn bids farewell to both Whiterun and the Riverwood survivors. The journey itself takes about three days, and while traveling, the Dragonborn learns more about Lydia and a romance begins to blossom between the two. Along the way, they fight off a pack of wolves and ice wraiths, culminating in a final battle with a frost troll who is immune to shouts. The troll ends up being a pretty tough opponent, and the dragonborn will even lose his new axe during the fight, resorting to wrestling and strangling the monster with his bare hands after wounding him with a poisoned dagger. The episode ends with the duo reaching High Hrothgar and being greeted by the Greybeards. Episode 9, The Greybeards. The Dragonborn is welcomed by the Greybeards, and he learns about Thum and how he has been chosen by the god Akatosh to be the last Dragonborn. The Greybeards, as per their duty, teach the Dragonborn in the Way of the Voice. However, they request that Lydia leave until the training is complete. This episode will be a training montage where the Dragonborn will learn about Dragon culture and the Greybeards' origins. The training itself will take place over the course of a few weeks, and by the end, he'll fully learn the shout, Fus Roda. Lydia returns to check up on the Dragonborn, just as the Greybeards task their new initiate with a rite of passage. He must return the horn of Jurgen Windcaller to them. Meanwhile, we see that the Dragon Cultists start to manipulate the Riverwood survivors into believing that the apocalypse is nearing, and through fear, they manage to recruit them into their ranks. Episode 10, Ustengrav. Lydia and the Dragonborn fight their way through the ancient underground tomb of Ustengrav to retrieve the horn. All the while, Lydia and the Dragonborn continue to grow closer to each other and they almost share a kiss. I want the Dragonborn and Lydia to be a badass team on the battlefield, where they're perfectly in sync with each other, they complement one another's moves, and they're always supporting each other. I want them to be a power couple like Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan in Pirates of the Caribbean. We see that the Dragonborn is far more able to hold his own this time around due to his proficiency in the voice. There's a lot more emphasis on evading traps and solving puzzles in this episode, which will culminate in the Dragonborn and Lydia reaching the end only to find that the horn has already been taken and in its place is a letter addressed to the Dragonborn, requesting him to come to Riverwood. Episode 11, Dead Reckoning. The duo returns to the decimated ruins of Riverwood to meet with Delphine, whom the Dragonborn recognizes as the former innkeeper. Delphine takes them to a secret underground bunker that is hidden beneath her burnt down inn. 
She catches the Dragonborn up to speed on the return of the dragons, the existence of the dragon slayers known as the Blades, as well as the fact that the dragon cultists have infiltrated most of Skyrim's governments. In this adaptation, we deemed it would be best to replace the Thalmor with the dragon cultists to help simplify the lore and streamline the story. Delphine offers to return the horn of Jurgen Windcaller to the Dragonborn in exchange for his help on a mission. He agrees, and the Dragonborn, Lydia, and Delphine investigate a dragon mount at Kinnisgrove, and instead of seeing Alduin resurrect a fallen dragon like we do in the game, it will actually be a group of cultists chanting in a circle and using necromancy to revive the dragon. The Dragonborn slaughters the cultists in an attempt to stop the ritual, but he's too late. Using his thum, the Dragonborn is able to single-handedly slay the resurrected dragon, marking a vast improvement from his first battle with Mermelnir. However, his steel sword is broken during the fight. He absorbs this dragon's soul, but as he does so, he receives a brief glimpse of the mighty Alduin. Delphine congratulates the Dragonborn on his kill, and honoring her promise, she returns the horn of Jurgen Wingcaller to the Dragonborn. Episode 12 Master of the Order On the road back to High Hrothgar, Lydia and the Dragonborn will share their first kiss. Later, the Dragonborn and Lydia return the horn to the Greybeards, and in return, they teach him the Whirlwind Sprint. The Greybeards admit that the Dragonborn has superseded their teachings, and for his training to continue, he must meet the Master of their Order, the Reformed Dragon Parthenax. For two weeks, the Dragonborn privately trained with the Old Dragon at the throat of the world, exchanging thooms and learning the fire breath shout as they form a healthy and trusting mentor-apprentice relationship. His training is interrupted when his old acquaintance Rayloth the Stormcloak barges into High Hrothgar, reporting that his master Ulfric was a former student of the Greybeards, knew that the Dragonborn was training here, and sent him to request his aid. Two dragons are attacking Windhelm as they speak and the Stormcloaks are nowhere near equipped enough to handle the threat. The Greybeards protest against this distracting interruption, as training with Parthenax is the greatest honor any mortal could possibly have. To leave so soon in the middle of his studies would disgrace their order. But the Dragonborn doesn't care. He will save those innocent lives if he can. Episode 13 Defense of Windhelm The Dragonborn, Lydia, and Rayloth ride to Windhelm which is barely holding together after the first wave of dragon attacks. The Stormcloaks manage to injure one dragon in Rayloth's absence, but the Hold can't withstand another assault. The Dragonborn and Ulfric Stormcloak quickly team up and begin coming up with a plan. To replace his broken steel sword, Ulfric upgrades the Dragonborn with a dragon bone greatsword from his vault. As they prepare Windhelm for the siege, Ulfric and the Dragonborn bond over their similar experiences as Nord warriors and fellow students of the Greybeards. Even though Ulfric knows the way of the voice, his training was prematurely ended when he left to fight in the Great War. So, the Dragonborn is far more powerful than he is in Thun, and this is why Ulfric needs his help. Ulfric will encourage Dragonborn to follow his own path and to not feel pressured into living his life according to someone else's rules, even if he is the chosen one, which contributes to the Dragonborn's character arc. Using Parthenax's lessons and exploiting the secrets of the dragons, the Dragonborn comes up with a strategy to defeat the invaders. Through the combined efforts of the Dragonborn, Ulfric, Lydia, and the Stormcloaks, both dragons are slain, but Rayloth is also killed. It doesn't matter which two dragons are used for this episode, so long as their scales are color-coded for the audience's convenience. Episode 14, The Embassy. This episode will be a reinterpretation of the Thalmor Embassy and Riften quest lines to help streamline the story. In the wake of Windhelm's triumph, Ulfric declares the Dragonborn a sworn shield brother and a true friend of the Stormcloaks. A feast is thrown, and in the ecstasy of the moment, Lydia will sleep with the Dragonborn, telling him that neither one of them know if they'll live to see another day in this dragon crisis, and she doesn't want to have any regrets after she witnessed their friend Rayloth perish. Delphine infiltrates Windhelm in the dead of night and covertly meets with the Dragonborn. She tells him that no matter what he's done today, more dragons will come. There is a high-ranking Imperial known as Jarl Illisif that is secretly funding the Dragon Cult and may have more information on how to end the Dragon Crisis. Wearing disguises, the Dragonborn and Lydia 
sneak into the embassy with the help of a drunk attendee and a man on the inside known as Malborn, while Delphine waits for them outside as their getaway driver. The Dragonborn and Lydia will act casual by sharing a dance, allowing their romance to blossom even further before they sneak into the office and acquire documents about how the cultists are preparing for Alduin's return. And, more importantly, we see an imprisoned old man known as Esburn being tortured by a dragon cultist. They free Esburn, but at the cost of blowing their cover and sounding the alarm. We can insert some joking game references here about lockpicking. After a chaotic escape and a fun chase sequence where Malborn becomes an unfortunate casualty, the protagonists reconvene and we learn that Esburn, whom Delphine had presumed dead, was able to find a map to Sky Haven Temple, the ancient and forgotten headquarters of the Blades. They're one step closer to finding out how to end the Dragon Crisis. Episode 15, The Prophecy. The four heroes head to Sky Haven Temple, expecting to have to fight through the local tribe of Forsworn, but they're appalled to see the corpses of 20 to 30 Forsworn brutally massacred across the temple. Someone else has been here. They discover seven cultists armed with magic within the temple, and a bitter fight breaks out between the two rival factions. But this is on a level we've never seen before from the cult. The battle is won, but one of the mages survives and escapes and Delphine loses an arm to a mage wielding a magically conjured bound sword. While Lydia tends to Delphine's wound, Esburn reads Alduin's wall, and the Dragonborn has a vision of the terrible black dragon as we finally see the face of the enemy. Alduin's return is inevitable, and when he does, the world will end, unless the dragon cult is stopped. The Dragonborn reveals that Parthenax may be able to help them since he was a former ally of the World Eater. Delphine is disgusted at how the Dragonborn can be affiliated with a dragon, but Esburn sees it as a necessary evil. The Dragonborn is tasked with getting the answers he needs from Parthenax, and before he leaves, he claims the sword Dragonbane from the temple's altar. We see the surviving cult mage being chastised by the cult's shadowy leader, who finally reveals himself to be Nakrin, as he commands the mage to prepare for the invasion. The episode ends as we see the effects of the Alduin prophecy come to fruition. As the World Eater draws nearer, his cultists get stronger. We see a montage of a few dragons being revived, chanting Alduin's name as they fly off to destroy several settlements. Episode 16, End Times. The Dragonborn and Lydia return to High Hrothgar, but the Greybeards refuse to let the Dragonborn pass since he's broken their sacred rules. But Parthenax shouts, shaking the mountain and demanding that his pupil be given clearance. The Dragonborn and Parthenax discuss how to defeat the Dragon Cult, and the Old Master reveals that the cult's headquarters are located in Skuldalfin Temple. However, even with Parthenax's training, besieging Skuldalfin would be a suicide mission due to the sheer size of the cult and the temple's strategic location within the Volathi Mountains. Seeing Dragonbane on his back, Parthenax discerns that his student has allied himself with the Blades, despite his warnings. And thus, the Dragonborn is expelled from Parthenax's teachings. The Dragonborn leaves in frustration. The episode ends with the resurrected dragons from the previous episode burning down hold after hold across all of Skyrim. Riften, Markoth, and Morthal are all consumed by dragonfire. Episode 17, Out of the Past. This episode will serve as our introduction to the Daedric Princes and serve as setup for the future gods that will be introduced in later seasons. Outside of High Hrothgar, Silas Vesuius recruits the Dragonborn into helping him find a weapon that can kill a dragon in a single blow. Silas reveals that the Dragon Cult has access to the pieces of a Daedric weapon called the Mayrune's Razor, but they never understood its significance. Silas has the knowledge to reassemble the Razor, but he needs the Dragonborn's help to acquire it. In a montage, we see the Dragonborn, Lydia, and Silas attack three different dragon shrines and collect all of the pieces of the Razor. However, we notice that the cult seems to be raising an army of Draugr and that many of the cultists are survivors from Riverwood. They blame the Dragonborn for failing to protect them when they needed him most. So, the Dragonborn spares the cultists out of guilt. But, Silas mercilessly executes them with Daedric magic, purely out of cold-hearted logic. The Dragonborn becomes conflicted on what it means to be Skyrim's savior, 
as he realizes more and more that he is either killing his fellow Nords or failing to save them all in the name of stopping Alduin. Lydia will do her best to comfort her lover, but as Silas reassembles the razor, Mayrune's Dagon contacts the Dragonborn telepathically. He declares that for the razor to be restored, Silas must be sacrificed. Again, the Dragonborn is conflicted, but in the end, he refuses, and Dagon mocks the Dragonborn's foolish honor and summons two Dremora in impenetrable Daedric armor. After they slice through the Dragonborn shield and steel armor like butter, and prove to be immune to shouts, the Dragonborn resourcefully manages to defeat the Dremora by getting creative with his thum and sending them tumbling off the side of the mountain. While the quest was a failure, Silas thanks the Dragonborn for all he's done. The bodies of the Dremora will disappear back into oblivion, leaving behind an ebony bow for the Dragonborn to claim. Episode 18, The Empire. The Dragonborn and Lydia reunite with the Blades and decide that they will need an army to take Skuldafen and the only way that they can get a big enough army is if they unite the divided peoples of Skyrim. They must find a way to bring about a truce between the Stormcloaks and the Empire. Since they already have the loyalty of the Stormcloaks, the heroes go to the Imperial City of Solitude to plead for the Empire's aid, but they are rejected. The Dragonborn reveals that the Dragon Cult has infiltrated the Imperial government based on the information he found at the Embassy, but the Imperials don't believe him. However, General Tullius investigates the matter just to be sure, but he gets too close to the truth and a few cultists disguised as Imperial Guards attempt to assassinate him. But the Dragonborn intervenes and saves Tullius. Jarl Elisif's guilt as a Dragon Cult conspirator is proven true, and a pitched battle breaks out in solitude between the loyal Imperial Guards and the cultist imposters. A battle that the Dragonborn helps to win by capturing and arresting Jarl Elisif. But the fight is far from over, as we see the surviving mage from Skyhaven Temple leading an army of Draugr and cultist cavalry towards Solitude. Episode 19, March of the Dead. This whole episode will be one large battle, like the Battle of Winterfell in the final season of Game of Thrones. The Siege of Solitude will essentially be the show's equivalent of the Battle of Helm's Deep as General Tullius rallies what remains of the Legion to defend Solitude until Imperial reinforcements arrive from Bruma. These Draugr will be capable of using their Thum to destroy buildings and fortifications, while the cultist mages will use fire and illusion spells to create chaos among the Imperial ranks. The Dragonborn uses his leadership skills to instill courage into the dwindling army of defenders, but his friend Hadvar still becomes one of the casualties when he sacrifices himself to save the Dragonborn from the cult mage. The two have a rematch, and the Dragonborn brutally avenges Hadvar. Reinforcements arrive just in time with the rising of the sun, showing that the Draugr are weakened by sunlight, and allowing the remaining invaders to be put to the sword effortlessly. The episode will end with the Dragonborn earning General Tullius' respect. Having almost died during the siege, the Dragonborn will tell Lydia that he agrees with her philosophy on not knowing whether they will live to see another day, and so he proposes to her. Episode 20 the treaty. Now that the Dragonborn has acquired the alliance of the Empire, he has Delphine and Esbern help him in calling for a treaty at Whiterun, since it is neutral territory for both the Stormcloaks and the Imperials. The two factions are too stubborn to come to an agreement, so the Dragonborn resorts to a different method. He escorts Tullius and Ulfric to the ruins of Helgen, where it all started, and guilt trips them into cooperating and ending their petty civil war for the greater good. Inspired by the Dragonbone Greatsword Ulfric gave him, the Dragonborn will have the Skyforge upgrade his gear to Dragonbone armor. Before the army marches out, the Dragonborn and Lydia will get married in a private ceremony, and as they consummate their marriage, they'll both reminisce about their childhoods and how they want to raise their future children together. Episode 21, Attack on Skuldafen. With the united Skyrim army, the heroes launch an epic siege on Skuldafen Temple ending with a climactic clash between the Dragonborn and Nakreen, the Dragon Priest cult leader. But Lydia is killed as collateral damage from their magical duel. A portal opens to the realm while Alduin is trapped. Time is running out. With Esbern's help, the Dragonborn pushes Alduin back into the portal with Nakreen's staff. But Alduin manages to pull the Dragonborn in with him as the portal closes. The episode ends with the Dragonborn awaking at Sovngarde the Nordic afterlife. 
Episode 22, The World Eater. The Dragonborn meets legendary deceased heroes from Skyrim, like Ysgrimor and Soon, as well as the soul of his dearly departed Lydia, whom he shares a heartbreaking farewell with. Ysgrimor will give the Dragonborn his shield as his final upgrade and tell him to use it to protect all of Skyrim. The final battle begins. The Dragonborn calls upon the aid of all of those that died in the Dragon Crisis. With the combined strength of Lydia, Fangdal, his mother, and all of the other souls, the Dragonborn manages to bind Alduin with the voice before slaying him with Dragonbane. Skyrim is saved, but the Dragonborn is forced to say goodbye to all of his loved ones as he returns to the physical world. The people of Skyrim assume that the Dragonborn is dead, and so he takes the opportunity to retire and live out the rest of his days in isolation as a hermit farmer. Even though this victory cost him everything, the Dragonborn takes comfort in giving Skyrim a better future. And that concludes our pitch for how we would adapt Skyrim into a TV show. Like we said, we had to cut out a lot of details about the plots of our episodes, but hopefully we got our point across to you guys. If you enjoyed our pitch for Season 1 and would like for us to pitch Seasons 2 and 3, then let us know in the comment section down below. As always, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can be the first to know when we drop a new video. Don't forget to like this video and I will catch you guys next time. As the Khajiit of Skyrim say, may your roads lead you to warm sands, my friends.